For most people, for most folks, the extent of their knowledge of the Ark of the Covenant begins and ends with the 1981 Steven Spielberg Harrison Ford movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. In this classic adventure, which I know you've seen, and if you haven't, you're, you should look it up. But in that classic movie, archaeologist Indiana Jones is searching for the long-lost Ark of the Covenant. He's desperately trying to find it before the Nazis, who seek to use its power for world domination. One of Jones' colleagues explains that an army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. Towards the end of the movie, there's a scene in which the Nazis open the Ark to look inside. They are greeted with a stunning display of what we assume to be the presence and power of God. The faces of two high-ranking Nazis melt, and the lead scientist and all the rest in attendance at the ceremony are struck dead, and their bodies completely consumed in fire. Indiana Jones and his sidekick Marion alone are able to survive only by closing their eyes, which presumably prevents them from looking upon the glory of God and being destroyed. This dramatic scene is based at least in part on the Old Testament belief that to look upon the glory of God was to die immediately. That's why any time an angel of the Lord appears to somebody in the Bible, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. Because of course people were going to be afraid. They believed they were seeing God, which meant they were about to die. Raiders of the Lost Ark is fiction, but it is accurate about at least one piece of the story. The Ark, as Indy points out in the film, is the box in which were placed the tablets bearing the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses at Sinai. According to Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant was actually an ornate box constructed explicitly for that purpose. But contrary to the movie, the Ark itself held no particular power. The significance for the Ark, of the Ark for the people of Israel lay in its symbolic representation of the presence of God. In instructing the Israelites in how to build the ark, God describes the ornate decorations atop the box, which includes two cherubim, their heads bowed and their wings reaching out toward one another. This would be known as the mercy seat and would function as God's throne on earth. In Exodus 25, God says to Moses, there I will meet you and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Covenant, I will deliver to you all my commandments for the Israelites. In other places, the Ark is described as God's footstool, as though God were enthroned above it, and the Ark itself is where God placed God's feet. Psalm 132, 7 refers to this notion, saying, Let us go to, this dwelling, to his dwelling place, let us worship at his footstool. And in the story that we just read in 2 Samuel 6, verse 2, we read the ark of God, which is called the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. So for the Israelites, the ark was not just a container for the tablets of the Ten Commandments. It was the location where God would be encountered. It was the symbol of God's presence in Israel. But counter to the mythology of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Controlling the Ark of the Covenant did not give one control over God. But that doesn't mean that people didn't try. The Philistines, made famous by Goliath in his encounter with David, were a historical thorn in the side of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 4 recounts one particular incident in which the Philistines soundly defeated the Israelites in battle. Unable to accept their defeat, the elders of Israel decide to go out, find the ark at its home in Shiloh, where Eli and Samuel were priests, and take it out into battle. When the soldiers see the ark arrive, they cheer loudly, and the Philistines are filled with fear. But when the ark, but the ark represents, remember, God's presence. Its presence does not guarantee access to God's power. The Philistines rout the Israelites even more soundly than the first time, and to make matters worse, they capture the ark. For the Israelites, that's worse than defeat. In a divine game of capture the flag, they have failed to protect theirs. The symbol of the presence of their God has fallen into the hands of their worst enemy. For some 20 years, the whereabouts of the ark are uncertain. 
1 Samuel tells us that while in Philistines' hands, the, the Philistines' hands, the ark brought them nothing but trouble, so that they put it on an unmanned ox cart and pointed it towards Israel, hoping that the ark would just find its way home. The story tells us that the ark did find its way back to Israel, but it's unclear whether it was simply neglected during Saul's reign or if it was then lost again. But either way, David decides to go in search of the ark and bring it to Jerusalem. As our story picks up today, we find David leading a procession of Israelites 30,000 strong as they attempt to do just that. The author tells us that David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. But the procession is interrupted when one of those accompanying the ark forgets the power it represents, and reaching out to steady it when it's jostled is struck dead. As a side note, it's very likely that this scene inspired Steven Spielberg in Raiders of the Lost Ark. As in the movie, those who fail to respect the power of God, as represented by the ark, pay a dear price. But as much as this scene in our reading suggests a capricious God who kills for the slightest error, it is intended it is intended to underscore the power of God associated with the presence of the ark. At this point in the story, though, at this point in the story, though David is angered at Uzzah's death, he is very much aware that what he is carrying into his new capital city is not just a box. This is no mere religious relic. This is not a piece of furniture. This ark represents the power and presence of God, which is not to be trifled with. And David realizes that bringing this holy symbol back into the midst of the people is a holy act. It is worship. Three months after the death of Uzzah, when David returns to finish the job, he does so with even more awareness of what he is doing and the proper way to approach God. Last time, the ark was hauled on an ox cart. There's almost no difference between the way the Israelites transport the ark and the way the heathen Philistines sent it back to Israel in the first place. But this time, we are told that the ark is being carried, as Exodus 25 instructed the Israelites to do. Poles attached to rings along the side of the ark allowed it to be carried by several men, much like a casket in a funeral. Furthermore, David is dressed in a linen ephod. Now, there is some disagreement over whether that was more like a loincloth or an apron, but either way, it was a fine garment normally worn by a priest, which, if worn with nothing else as David did, would have left a little too much to the imagination. After the procession has gone six paces, they stop and sacrifice an ox and a fatling. David danced with all his might, and when the ark reached Jerusalem, there were more sacrifices and offerings to God, and then David shared of his wealth and the blessings of God by distributing to all the people cakes of bread and raisins and portions of meat. What we see in this story is David becoming aware of the power and presence of God and responding accordingly. In honoring God with his worship, David does things the right way. He puts his whole self into honoring God, and he shares what God has given him with others. Now, we are mostly familiar with worship. I mean, we're here, right? And we know that worship is a part of our response to God's goodness and mercy. But I'm not convinced that we always come before God ready to give our whole selves to the task of worship. By contrast, in just a few days from now, this community will bear witness to one of the largest, most fervent and energetic worship services anywhere in the world. Literally thousands of completely dedicated people will gather in one place to offer praise and devotion. They will sing holy songs and recount stories of the faithful who led their community and who sacrificed themselves for what they valued. They will lift their voices to the heavens in praise and thanksgiving. There will be a few people dancing with all their might and more than enough sacramental wine. And no one will be embarrassed to pledge their undying love and devotion. But this worship service won't be held in any church, at least not in the traditional sense. And it won't be a service of worship to God, at least not the God we've gathered to worship today. No, it'll be the opening home football game down at the horseshoe. (laughs) 
And on that same day, there will be hundreds of similar services of worship taking place in similar holy places all over the country. Places with names like Death Valley, The Swamp, The Big House. And millions more of the devout will congregate in front of flickering televisions in homes and bars and restaurants to offer praise and devotion there as well. Yes, college football is kicking off this week. And by the time your Buckeyes take the field on Saturday, my Gamecocks will have already played their first game on Thursday night. And I will have already spent several hours hunkered down in front of a television set watching it. Now, of course, no one would seriously consider their favorite football team to be holy, and no one would describe their devotion to a favorite team as worship, but when you think about it, it kind of is. There are great cathedrals, like the aforementioned Horseshoe and the Rose Bowl. There are well-known and oft-quoted liturgies, the Buckeyes, OHIO, Alabama's Roll Tide, cherished traditions, like South Carolina running out onto the field to the theme from 2001 or dotting the I in Script, Ohio. There are icons and holy relics, the rock at Clemson, the Eli Buck Trophy. There are sacraments generally received at tailgate parties. And there are individuals revered as heroes of the faith. Think Woody Hayes, Archie Griffin. Now where I come from, it's often said that college football is a religion and every Saturday is a holy day. And while those who say it often do so with tongue planted firmly in cheek, I believe that there's a great amount of truth in that statement. Now, not everyone loves football the way that some do, but many of us have some sort of obsession, whether it's a sport or a hobby or a career, that takes most of our time and gets most of our attention and our love and our energy. And while this is not necessarily a bad thing, We've gotten something seriously backwards when we put our total energy and attention into some thing that isn't God. And then when it comes time to worship, give God the leftovers. I knew a mother in the first church that I served who would allow her daughter to play on Friday night and Saturday and then skip worship on Sunday morning because she had homework to do. There was a church not far from the one where we were in South Carolina that a few years ago, when Christmas fell on a Sunday, canceled services so as not to interfere with family Christmas morning traditions. For too many of us, worship has become something we do if it's convenient, if it feels good, if there's nothing better to do. But not David. David puts everything he has into worshiping God. There's a line from an old song, work like you don't need the money, love like you've never been hurt, dance like nobody's watching. That was David. He was unafraid of what others would think. In fact, he was chastised by his own wife for making a fool of himself, but he didn't care. David offered sacrifices and shared with people a portion of that with which God had so richly blessed him. He made a joyful noise and praise and thanksgiving, unconcerned with whether his singing or his music or his dancing was good enough. He offered these acts of worship not because they were the best, but because they were his best. His awareness of God's presence elicited the only appropriate response David could imagine, total authentic worship. And that's what I think we should take away from this story, that God is important enough, what God has done is meaningful enough that we should give worship our full attention. Worship's not about what we receive, it's about what we give. I heard a story about an elderly woman recently who, having lost her hearing and most of her sight, continued to request a ride to church every Sunday. When a friend asked her why she bothered since she couldn't hear the sermons, the prayers, or the music, she replied, I go to show whose side I'm on. So many times I hear from people that they just don't like church because it's boring, because they don't like the sermons or the hard pews or something else. I've also heard folks say that that they really like to go to worship when they're entertained, when they like the music, or when the minister tells funny stories. But all of that is about what we get out of worship. And while it's wonderful when we get something powerful and thought-provoking out of our worship experiences, ultimately worship is not about what you get from it, but about what you bring to it. That's why we call this a congregation not an audience. 
We're not here to observe people. We're not here to observe worship. We're here to do it. As the people of God, it is at our core, it's at the core of our beings to give ourselves to God in worship, to come before God in praise and thanksgiving, to offer to God the best we have, even if it's not the best there is, to listen and to think about what we hear, to consider how we're being called to live the gospel, to celebrate and honor God's great gifts of life and love and mercy, most perfectly revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So clear your schedule, set aside some time, turn your phone off, eat a good healthy breakfast, and worship God with all your might. And then, if you have some time and energy left over, go watch some college football. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come.